Amen. Reformation Sunday. It's the day we look at our faith, look at the gospel, look at what we believe, teach, and confess. It's something that's old, 2,000 years old, and it's fresh as today. But more importantly, whether it's old or new, depending on how you look at it, it is tried, tested, and true. And that's what I want to share with you today. C.S. Lewis wrote in, I believe it's Mere Christianity, that when you get down to it, there are basically two forms of religion. One, and it's one that, uh, to be honest, no matter how many bits of variety you add to it, how many spices you put with it, it gets down to the same thing. It's the religion of where you earn God's reward, whether it be through reincarnation, another version of heaven, or whatever. It gets down to you find a way to get God to give you a reward for your good service. And then there's Christianity, and it stands alone. It stands alone because it's the only form of religious expression whereby you bring nothing of value to the table. In fact, the only thing you bring is that which is why you need Christianity. You bring your sins. God takes your sins and gives you his righteousness because of Jesus Christ. Pretty simple when you think about it, isn't it? And yet, here we are on Reformation Day. We'll talk about that. But first, let's pray. Almighty God, you have called your church to witness that in Christ you have reconciled us to yourself. Grant that by your Holy Spirit we may proclaim the good news of your salvation so that all who hear it may receive the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Romans chapter 3, beginning at verse 19, says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. When Paul wrote those words, those who are under the law, he had his fellow Jews in mind. Today, we would likely be thinking of church folk. Either way, the people to whom this point refers are people who are aware of the law and of its demands. They knew that while the law could tell you what you should be doing, it could not empower you to do those things. As Solomon wrote, there is nothing new under the sun. Now, I don't know how heavy those two stone tablets were when Moses brought them down from Mount Sinai, but it's even easier for us to break them today than it was for him to do so on that day. So many people clamor about their rights their autonomy, failing to realize that not only do your rights have a boundary of my existence, but your rights only exist because God created you in his image. The gazelle has no rights that the cheetah feels bound to respect when supper time comes. So when people today talk about how empowering it is to be godless, or more to the point, to not have the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ as their God, because as Dr. Luther wrote, whatever you put your trust in, that's your God. And it might be yourself, but so be it. At least be honest, that's what you worship, you. 
but they don't realize, again, it's only because the law of God exists that we can make demands regarding rights at all. It's God's law that identifies you as a person instead of as property of the state. It's God's law that says we are accountable for our actions. No matter where we sit in the socioeconomic hierarchy, it's God's law that says we will answer for what we have done because there is the creator to whom we must give an account. And if God gave us, each and every one of us, what we deserve, global warming and overpopulation would be the least of our worries. Too many, even now, fulfill the words of the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter 3, beginning at verse 3. Knowing this, first of all, the scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. It might seem like nothing has changed, but just look at the difference between the times when you all were young adults and the experiences of young adults today. There are so many more things clamoring for their attention than clamored for yours. So many idols for them to bow down before, so many objects of lust to ensnare them, and so many ways of access. The parents of the boomers worried about rock and roll and the corrosive influence of Elvis. At least they understood what he was singing about. People say that the old ways don't work anymore, that God is too small, outdated, but the Bible doesn't have the answers to the questions that this generation is asking. But according to a recent report by the Barna Institute, teens and young adults today are hyper-connected, globally-minded, success-oriented, and while open to faith and spirituality, they remain skeptical, excuse me, skeptical of the church. We see that teens are open to Jesus, the Bible, and confronting injustice. And further, their commitment to these three things are interwoven and increased together. To put it another way, the more they begin, become involved in fighting against injustice, the more they see that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke to justice, the more they come to see that Jesus Christ is whom they should follow if they truly hunger and thirst for righteousness. But the church somehow doesn't get caught up in that assessment. Instead, they see the church as at best extraneous, at worst, an obstacle. Well, one solution to these problems for me and other church leaders is just to focus on our generation. You know, all of you people who around my age maybe got as much gray hair as me, although some of you are luckier than me. But you know, you know who you are. It's familiar, it's comfortable. Best of all, you're already here. I don't have to work hard, think deeply, or cross cultural boundaries. Neither do our elders, or the elders and deacons of Good Shepherd. We're preaching to the choir when we preach and teach. And too bad that solution leaves a lot of people untouched by us. You know, the average age in Gary is now 39 years old. How long has it been since you were 39 years old? If it's more than 20 years, that is not your generation. Now, one of the ways I think we differ, especially with the 16 to 30-year-old cohort, is in the fact that they can simultaneously talk about not being judgmental while being extremely critical concerning those with whom they disagree. Their concept of justice or righteousness leaves no room for differing opinions or perspectives. Cancel culture makes no room for struggling. You are either on their side of the line or you have no value to them. You're canceled. There is no place for growth, no room for repentance, no space 
for struggle. You either get right or get left. And if you don't see things their way, well, you're just lost. It's like the great white throne judgment with your children or your grandchildren standing in for Jesus. But at the same time, God's law is viewed with disfavor by this group because according to it, there are things that God views as sinful that this group sees as okay. Now, obviously, Tristan, because you've been well catechized, I really don't have you in mind when I think about this. Or you, friends. I'll be working with you soon. No, I'm thinking about those young adults who primarily get their perspective on the world from social media, from their friends and people in their age group, who look at anything that happened before the digital age as ancient history, and any knowledge that you have that they can't confirm on TikTok or Instagram or whatever these things are called, as not even true, it's just what you think about it, your opinion. But God views these things as sinful and they think they're okay, especially as it pertains to the orders of creation. What God means for good, they see as evil. They have put God in the dock, to borrow from the title of a C.S. Lewis book. How dare God call a person's sexual preferences, desire for personal autonomy or self-identification evil? How did everything get so backwards? And what are we to do? Lutherans have wrestled with this issue before we knew it was an issue because we've long understood that justification is the article of our confession upon which the church stands. Dr. Luther, Philip Melanchthon, and other Lutheran theologians recognize that the law of God is good and righteous. We, on the other hand, are by nature sinful and unclean. Don't say amen, you already did it earlier. But distilling the commandments to their essence, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, and all of your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself, we cannot do what the law demands to the extent that it demands all day, every day. Romans 13, beginning at verse 8, says, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandment. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. It doesn't matter whether you are the apple of your mommy's eye or the perennial whipping boy of your daddy's disappointment. God declares that he has made a way to make you clean, to make you whole, to make you righteous. Romans 3, beginning in verse 21, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all has sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation, a mercy seat by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he has passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, at the time where you are right now. This moment, God shows his righteousness so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Put it another way, God, the righteous judge is also God, the great physician. God, the good shepherd. God, the lawyer who never lost the case. 
God, our Savior. He is the one we need. Oh, you can give him a hand, praise. So that's his word that he says about himself. He's all that and more, as a choir once sang. He's the one we need. Not when everything has failed. I know that song too. When you tried everything and everything has failed, try Jesus. No, that's not when you need him. <laughs> He's what you need because everything will fail. Heaven and earth will pass away, but Jesus never fails. Jesus is the champion. And it's not about us. It's about Jesus. Yeah, I know some folk don't like that contemporary Christian stuff. You know, all of those. <laughs> those are some pretty good songs there. But more importantly, they tell the truth. That's who Jesus is. Jesus truly is all that and then some. Oh, in Islam, they've got 99 names for God. 99, that's just what Jesus does before breakfast. You would never run out of good things to say about Jesus if you named every good thing he's done. And he's only just getting started, saints. But let me continue with God's word here. Romans 3, 27 and 28. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Now, by we, I don't just mean Lutheran. Oh, yes, we do hold that. But I mean that by we, everyone who's come to know by faith that Jesus Christ is our Savior, that he died for me, that when I look in the mirror, when you look in the mirror, and you think about what Jesus has done for you, and your soul cries out, hallelujah, I thank God for saving me. He did that. He didn't wait for you to get better. He didn't wait for you to figure it out. Matter of fact, there are very few people that figured it out before they came to Jesus. C.S. Lewis was a really smart man. Most of us are not that smart. But even he struggled with it. He described himself as a most reluctant convert because it meant giving up everything that he had built up, everything that he had trusted in, everything that he thought was made life, life. He had to let that all go. And that's not an easy thing to do. Paul the apostle had to do the same thing even he said about himself, you know what? If it were by works of the law, hey, I've got it covered. Everything that we said you needed to do to be righteous before God, I've done it. Whatever of those things, whatever I might have thought was gain to me before God, I count that as garbage. So that I could have the righteousness which comes from God that's the righteousness that gives you eternal life. That's the righteousness that gives you peace with God. That's the righteousness that enables you to have peace with your neighbor, whether they have peace or not. Faith in Jesus Christ is not easy access into heaven. It's easy only access into heaven. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus because he alone won't let you down. Now, when you all were young, you might have thought you were Superman or Superwoman. You were perfect. Or maybe you were the exact opposite. You were nothing in your own eyes. Doesn't matter. Jesus Christ is Lord of all. He's the Savior of all who trust in him. And when he is your righteousness, he is all you need. Whatever your age demographic, your economic position, your race or ethnicity, Jesus is all you need. He is everything you need. He is your rock, your sword, your shield. And when the Pope forgot it, when the world denies it, 
when the devil tries to obscure it, Jesus Christ just shines that much brighter into the lives of those who have eyes to see. Eyes that he gives us by his grace. His word just heals even more those who have ears to hear. Ears that he's healed by the word of his grace. His spirit just forgives all the more those whom he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies. That's the message for the church to receive and declare in the world until the Lord returns for the restoration of all things. And he will show up on time and his reward will be with him. So let the peace of God that passes all understanding Guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.